once you begin your broadcast. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm back. And I uh, hope everybody had a good lunch. And what we're going to do now, I did, um, I did my homework. I looked up the uh, rubrics. One, um, the rubella, uh, we were searching in the generality section, but it's in the skin eruptions rubella. So let me uh, look. Skin eruptions rubella. Let me get the page number for that. Hmm. It must, it's not in my book, but in my computer, it was in Skin Eruptions Rubella. So that's a mystery. Okay. The other information on um, uh, one cheek red, the other um, pale, that would be fever. Fever, and that's right after the chill section. Fever remittent. Oh, so let's see. That's on page twelve eighty nine. Fever remittent uh, with redness of one cheek, paleness of the other towards the bottom and you see um, we got aconite and chamomile and there's another place where you can find that fever side and that's at the top of page 1290 fever side one-sided one cheek red and hot the other pill and cold and that's aconite Okay, so that's two sections there for um, that peculiar symptom of um, one cheek red, the other cheek pale. Okay, let's go to our case. Um, JT is a five-year-old boy with acute right-sided ear infection. That started yesterday in his sleep. The ear infection started yesterday after his brother broke his favorite toy. So, um, you know, with that particular history, you'd want to investigate how he reacted to his brother breaking his favorite toy. Uh, you know, never, never jump to conclusion. Um, you know, you might think it's anger, you might think it's sadness, it could even be, um, you know, a strange reaction, like he was relieved because his mother would then buy him a new toy. So you'd never know. Uh, the problem is when you're taking a case, we tend to jump to the reaction, how we would respond to it, not the patient. So you almost have to pretend like you're a five-year-old and you don't understand anything and you always need clarification. So he's screaming from the pain and wouldn't let you examine his ear. Um, the eardrum looks quite red and swollen. His mother can't satisfy him, and he keeps changing his mind what he wants. So there's this capriciousness, changing the mind. He doesn't want to be touched. His mother notes that he cried in his sleep last night. He also has diarrhea and loose green stools. Now we remember that concomitant that we reviewed a short while ago, uh, the ear pain um, and uh, diarrhea. So anytime you have a concomitant like that, um, you need to really, you know, real, your, your ears really need to perk up uh, because this is something that um, um, will help you lead to remedy. So 
What is important in this case? It's a right-sided air infection. We can use the rubric air inflammation media. It's interesting that the symptoms started after his brother broke his favorite toy. We might consider using the rubric mind ailments from anger, um, which is um, a favorite rubric of mind, uh, especially in ophthalmology because the liver and eye are tied together and the liver is related to anger and frustration. So a lot of times I, I see a connection between eye disease and anger. <laughs> He's screaming from the pain, so you can use the rubric mind shrieking, uh, mind shrieking from pain. There is a rubric mind capriciousness. So that's look in our Kent's repertory under that mind capriciousness and I already mentioned it's a good idea that you know you take time and maybe every day um, read a section read part of a section in Kent because that's the only way that you're really going to become better and we see page 10 mind capriciousness and we want to look at the bold remedies baronia chamomilla Sina, Epicacum, Calicarb, and Staphys agria. Um, this is uh, an issue of the case of not wanting to be touched, but this is a true of his ear and in general. This is a mental symptom, and the best place to find it is mind touched aversion to being. So let's look there. Mind touched. Mind touched. Here we are, and that is page 89, towards the bottom left, mind, aversion, touched. Okay. All right. And we can see some of the remedies there. Antimonium crudum, chamomilla, cali carb, and tarantula. Um, so this is an interesting point to make here. Why is it a mental symptom and not a physical? Well, because it has to do with his whole body, true of his ear and in general. So we always like symptoms that relate not only to one particular physical part of the body, but the person in general. Um, and that has a stronger weight than if it was just be, he doesn't like his ear being touched, but he doesn't like to be touched. Uh, the crying in his sleep is quite strong and can be found under weeping sleep during. And that would be under mind. So let's look under mind weeping and you can see in the mind section starting on page 92 and i hope you have your book out with me uh, on page 92 we have a lot of um, weeping sub rubrics weeping daytime morning afternoon evening weeping in the air weeping aloud alternating with cheerfulness uh, and weeping uh, Sleep um, in sleep. There we are. Weeping in sleep. 94. Chamomile is there very strong. Uh, what is odd in the case is green stool. You can find us under stool green or rectum diarrhea green. The later is not in Kent's repertory, but the complete. So you're not going to find it in Kent. So these are the rubrics. Uh, and uh, the remedy that comes up most strongly, chamomilla, belladonna, pulsatilla, lycopodium, and hepar. If you study the remedies, and um, how do you study the remedies? Well, pull ad borigis, uh, pocket manual of Materia Medica, and read about each one of those. And it seems like chamomilla fits best. So chamomilla is the answer. Although some of you submitted the homework assignment and did uh, give me the answer, Belladonna, Pulsatella, 
and he himself was a, a, a consideration. But I feel that even though chamomilla was the indicated remedy, probably belladonna would also act. Any one of these remedies would probably have some action. So I don't want you to think if you didn't know it and get it exactly right, um, you're not going to have any effect. You know, remember homeopathy where it's not a gain, especially in these acute cases where you have to get the exact remedy to have some beneficial effect. Even though in this case, um, uh, chamomilla was given, I think belladonna would actually, actually have a good effect too. All right. Any questions um, on the case? <laughs> questions on the case? Okay, you guys did a, a great job. And this was the only uh, homework uh, assignment that you had. So I'm not going to review uh, some of the other uh, cases, uh, mainly because... I didn't really like the cases and I thought they were more constitutional and I just wanted to focus on uh, the acute prescribing. Okay, we're going to now talk about an important topic called the second prescription. And um, um, so when do you repeat the second prescription? Um, well, the main thing to remember is when the action runs out. So that means that when you do prescribe a homeopathic remedy and there is some type of beneficial effect and it clearly begins to lose its effect, then it can be repeated or as often as every 15 minutes or once an hour or every four hours. So um, you have to um, observe the patient or, you know, give uh, the person instructions, you know, take a, take the a pellet. And as long as you're feeling well, you don't have to repeat it. This is really hard in homeopathy because, you know, in traditional medicine, uh, we're trained to, um, when we take an antibiotic, it's, you know, four times a day for 10 days, uh, no ands, ifs, or buts. It doesn't matter how you react. In homeopathy, it's different. Remember, the remedy is acting as a catalyst to try to push the body back to homeostasis or balance. So when the remedy begins to lose its effect, then you repeat. You need to repeat the remedy more often when the state is more intense. And the reason for that is when you have an intense state, I like in the analogy that the in intense state is eating up the remedy. So you have a battle going on. You have a high fever of the body, and you also have a remedy which is causing the fev fever. You want the homeopathic remedy that's causing the f or, or producing a fever or a similar for fever to take over so the body doesn't need a fever. So if the fever is intense, then you need a more repetition or a stronger remedy. So the vital force kind of sucks up the remedy, uses it more quickly, and you need it more often. The second prescription. Any questions on the second prescription? Because I think this is one of the uh, more uh, difficult areas for beginning practitioners to uh, grasp. So if you do have any questions, just raise your hand and we can discuss it or you can uh, type the question. Okay, we'll move on. So, repetition of the remedy. When the remedy no longer works, need to go to a higher impotency or need a new remedy. So generally, um, what I like to do the first step is to uh, repeat the remedy. If the remedy doesn't work, then go to a higher potency. But many of you only have one potency in your remedy kit. Later on, you may want to get uh, a 200C kit. So you start with a 30C, and then if that doesn't work, go to a 200C, and later on, maybe even go to a higher potency, a 1M. Um, so your next investment, if you're serious about homeopathy, 
is to get to a second level homeopathic kit. Of course, this comes into expense. There are many good homeopathic pharmacies and pharmacies in the material that I gave you. You can always contact the pharmacy and have the pharmacy send, you know, your client or patient uh, the homeopathic remedy in a higher potency. If you go higher and it doesn't work, then you need a new remedy. You got to retake the case. You got to look ag- look again at what's going on. And remember, the first slide I showed you was this idea of complementary remedies. So you may want to look in uh, Boricky under complementary and look for a remedy that is complementary, a remedy that is similar and try that one because that may indeed be a much better remedy than the first one. Um, In acute cases, it's not unusual to need a couple of remedies. Uh, This occurs very often when you're treating a flu, uh, a cold, or, you know, influenza. Usually you have to go through a couple different remedies. It's always nice when you just give one remedy and that's the end of the story. But in practicality, um, you need. Okay, I think Debbie had a question, and I need some clarification on this. Uh, Debbie, what was your question? Did, you said, can you hear me? Yep, I hear you fine. Yeah, it wasn't really a question. I was just... Uh, uh, reiterating what you had said to me during our 30 minute consult is be careful not to give the second one unless really needed and you retake the case but then you said that okay yeah by second you don't give it at the same time you know you're going to wait for the first remedy to kind of run its course so uh, you never I, I never give two remedies at once so let's say you have a really high fever and you give belladonna and there's no action in 15 minutes that I might try aconite No, I was thinking like a week or a month later doing a second one, but you kind of said no to that to me. Right. No, unless, unless it's needed, you know, there's new symptoms and points to that new remedy. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay. So once again, um, it's always, always best in homeopathy to wait. Wait until the new picture is stable, usually 24 hours. But I mean, if it's an acute situation like a fever, you're not going to want to wait that long. But generally, the best policy is wait. Um, In constitutional treatment, and this course is not really constitutional, uh, the more accurate the remedy, the less you need to repeat it. So... Sometimes when you select a remedy this close, like the case we had for homework, uh, you know, chamomilla was the right remedy. It was probably a similament for the case. But if you gave belladonna, you may find that you had to repeat the belladonna more frequently to maintain the effect. So when that happens and you need to repeat the remedy more frequently, you may be close, but not the exact remedy. So that's something to consider. Also, the weaker the vital force the more often you'll need to repeat the remedy because it doesn't hold. So that I mean, if you have an elderly person, debilitated, uh, low energy, uh, you're going to need more of the homeopathic remedy simply because the person's vital force can't take over. The homeopathic remedy is trying to act as a catalyst, but the person's body is just, is just weak, is just weak. Um, when there's a complete relapse, repeat the remedy in the same potency. If it was antidoted, wait a couple of weeks, um, and sometimes it'll, uh, kick back in. So what do I mean by antidoted? Well, if somebody did something that aggravated the remedy or antidoted it. And we talked about ways of antidoting a remedy, sometimes a dental procedure, cup of coffee, mint. um, And you can look at the antidotes. Each particular remedy has a a strong antidote. And that's also in Boraki. Like for example, sepia, 
the antidote is uh, vinegar and sour things, uh, Nux Vomica, it's coffee. So if um, uh, the remedy's working and they antidote it, sometimes it's best to wait until um, the remedy, uh, it may kick in by itself. If it doesn't, you can repeat the remedy in the same potency. If it doesn't kick back in, if repeating the remedy doesn't work, then you either need to uh, go to a higher potency or retake the case. Uh, a partial relapse. Uh, and determine if the individual recover on their own. Stress sometimes will cause this. Acute problems will cause a partial relapse. Um, but once again, these repetition and remedies in this, what we're discussing, uh, has more to do with uh, constitutional um, uh, case taking, not so much acute, but the um, the philosophy is uh, still applicable. A stalled case, lack of further improvement, wait a couple months, improvement may be noticeable with time, repeat in a higher potency. One thing that I've learned in homeopathy and all the great homeopaths practice this way, you need patience. Uh, let the body uh, do its thing. Remember, homeopathy is a catalyst. And um, sometimes the action that takes place is, is very, very slow. So when in doubt, it's always best to wait. The problem that most beginning homeopathic students have is they repeat the remedy too frequently, especially in constitutional cases. Uh, and that's why when you're not sure, if there's not a clear picture, wait. Because if you do repeat the remedy unnecessarily, you can have a remedy proving. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the duration of action, a 200C will last six to nine months. With a weaker vital force, it may be shorter. 1M can last a year. Um, a 30C uh, should last um, you know, uh, three months or so. If there's an aggravation, do not repeat the remedy. Wait and be patient. So by an aggravation, uh, if you give a homeopathic remedy, and I'm talking about constitutional, not, not acute. Let's say somebody has, um, uh, you know, uh, chronic uh, arthritis of their left knee and you give a homeopathic remedy and right after you give the remedy the arthritis becomes worse that's an aggravation it's not uncommon when you get the aggravation it's kind of homeopathic remedy is interaction interacting with the vital force so it's always better uh, to wait to wait on that okay if there's a complete relapse all the symptoms come back, repeat the remedy in the same potency, wait two weeks. If it was antidoted, sometimes it will kick back in. Uh, partial relapse, uh, retake the case. Uh, allopathic medicine sometimes will cause a partial relapse, and that's the danger treating people that are taking a lot of... Um, allopathic medications. That's one of the reasons why I like the LM potencies. Uh, although this course, we're really not dealing with the LMs. Uh, the LMs are, um, Hahnemann talked about the LMs in the sixth edition of, of the organ on. Most homeopathic doctors practice the fifth edition. The sixth edition, he talked about LMs, which is a homeopathic preparation that you take every day because of um, uh, uh, the group of people that I deal with are elderly, they're taking other medications, they may not be in tune to homeopathy or not, may not want to make the dietary changes or stop taking substances, which might be relating to antidoting. Um, the LMs are something that you take um, every day. Okay, let's see. 
poison remedies like venom remedies and anosodes don't you don't want to repeat. So arsenicum, lachesis, and you also don't want to give them in a low potency either. Um, reason is the lower potency has more physical substance, especially the X potencies. Uh, some of these homeopathic remedies can be extremely toxic if uh, you repeat them too frequently. So the general rule is don't repeat a uh, homeopathic remedy too frequently. Uh, LM is different. You're using daily doses and you're tailoring it to the patient. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the LM, but the LM, you take it uh, every day, um, usually a teaspoon and a half a cup of water, but sometimes you'll take a half a teaspoon. Sometimes you'll dilute it more. The LM has this ability to tailor it. First follow-up uh, visit in a constitutional case it's six to eight weeks. Uh, some homeopathic doctors uh, wait three months. Uh, I know a really good homeopathic doctor, he doesn't care what is going on with the patient. He waits three months, and then he evaluates the case. In my practice, I usually evaluated one month uh, just to make sure that there's nothing going on, ad adverse going on. And most of the times, uh, the one month visit is just to reassure the, pe the person. In acutes, it's much different. You're going to evaluate in one to two days. And in many cases, you're going to be ev evaluating in a couple of hours or you're going to be there with the person, especially if it's a family member. Um, and once again, with the acute, um, it depends on the severity. So obviously, if you have a high fever, 140 degrees, you're not going to get belladonna and say, I'll check on you in two days. You're going to want to know what's going on in 15 minutes to an hour, whether you can, you know, whether you want to repeat the um, um, repeat the remedy uh, or look for another remedy. How to evaluate the success of the remedy? You go through all the symptoms, uh, every symptoms, you know, that laundry list of symptoms that you have come up with, all the symptoms that you use to determine what. Um, uh, what you use to select a remedy. That's why keep good notes, write all the symptoms, and you're going to find out, inquire about each one of those bullet points, um, you know, what changes have occurred um, and uh, uh, what has happened with each one of those symptoms. You want to know the energy, mental, and emotional symptoms. Um, now, with the constitutional prescribing, the energy, mental, and emotional are very important. Sometimes the physical doesn't get better, but the mental and emotional will, that's good for a constitutional. But typically with an acute, you want to see a change in the physical. If you're treating a high fever, you want that fever to get better. If you're treating a sore throat, you want the sore throat to get better. You know, you don't really emphasize the mental and emotional unless the mental and emotional was really strong to begin with, like that chamomile patient uh, with strong irritability, then um, if you give the remedy and the irritability is, is really reduced, but the ear pain may be questionable or plus or minus, it's a good remedy. Um, you also want to observe um, new symptoms, different symptoms, life changes in dreams. But once again, uh, life changes um, and dreams are more for constitutional cases, not for acute. Different symptoms. Um, remember, we talked about pulsatilla. Pulsatilla is hot like coal. All of a sudden, there's a dramatic temperature change. They may be going from the acute homeopathic remedy to the chronic. If all of a sudden they become chilly and more reserved, then you might think of uh, silica. Hearing's law. Earlier in the course, we talked about hearing's law. And I can't emphasize how important hearing's law is. Uh, hearing's law um, is a, a law in homeopathy that determines how disease enter the body and how it heals. For those of you that might have forgot, hearing's law state that the body heals from inside outward, from top to down, 
and from most, most recent to old symptoms. So if you get a discharge after taking a homeopathic remedy, that's good. That discharge means that uh, the body's healing from inside outward. Also, the person may have had an old history of uh, skin discharges or sinus discharges or skin eruptions. That's a return of old symptoms. Also, the body tends to heal from above to below. So if you have a diffuse rash all over the body, the head may clear first and gradually the feet will be last. If the person is better, uh, even slightly in some aspect, it is best to wait. And when in doubt, always wait. And um, after practicing homeopathy for close to 20 years, I think this is one of the most important things to do is to wait. Now, it's different if nothing is better. If there's no changes, then... Um, you need to um, look at a different remedy, retake the case. But waiting is the hardest part. Now, protecting the remedy. Um, evaluating interfering factors that suppress or confuse the vitality or antidote the remedy action. Uh, of course, this really isn't an issue with most acute cases because you're there and you're going to see the results. But when you're doing constitutional homeopathic prescribing, and I hope all of you take the next step and look at maybe studying constitutional homeopathy, um, you need to look at factors that will antidote the remedy. Um, destructive habits of the person can interfere with the remedy. So if people don't make the dietary changes, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, et cetera, that's going to interfere with the homeopathic remedy. So there's a certain amount of education that needs to go into treating constitutional and also therapy, either psychotherapy, some type of behavioral modification, which will also help the action of the homeopathic remedy. Finding the second remedy. Let's assume that um, you prescribe a remedy and it doesn't have quite the action that you want. Um, oftentimes that second prescription begins before you give the first remedy. By that, you may be thinking of layered cases. You may be thinking of complementary remedies. You may be thinking of the chronic remedy uh, or the acute remedy. Let's say, for example, you have a clear-cut belladonna case, but the person has certain characteristics of calcarea cabarnica, uh, chubby, chilly, perspiration on the head. You know, they have that history, and they have an acute fever, which you give belladonna and they resp respond well, then you may be thinking of calcarea carbonica uh, as you give that first remedy. You always need to look at miasmatic influences. You know, the big three miasms, sora, psychotic, syphilitic, um, because you may need a miasmatic remedy to follow. Weight for the picture to crystallize before prescribing. Sometimes you need to wait until it stops changing, and that can be for three weeks. So you need stabilization. If the person has um, changeable symptoms and things are not settled, kind of think of, um, you know, stirring the pot that you need uh, to let the dust settle which you don't want to make the mistake, is chasing after a homeopathic remedy um, whenever things, when things are unsettled, and then you're going to be getting into trouble by not selecting a good remedy and just confusing the picture even more. Uh, one of the best ways of handling this dilemma is the use of placebo. 
Um, I occasionally use placebo. I know in India and some other countries, a placebo is really big. In fact, many clinics in India, they want to see the patient every week. And every week, the person is giving a placebo. And of course, they think they're getting a new homeopathic remedy or a repetition of the dose. Um, so it's, you know, um, the people that we treat, they, they usually want more. They get that initial high with the homeopathic remedy and they really feel good. And then things seem to settle and they want more of a remedy or they want a stronger remedy. This is where the placebo is indicated. And uh, I had a, a humorous uh, case. I had a patient who did very well with the homeopathic remedy, but every, every week she'd come back and I would give her a placebo and I would give her a certain size homeopathic pellet for the placebo. So she came back one week and I didn't have, have that size and I had to give her a smaller size sack lac uh, or placebo. And uh, she called me on the phone and said, Dr. Kondrat, that remedy didn't work. You know, even though it was a placebo, the fact that it was a different size pellet, she felt it wasn't as good. So the placebo, use of the placebo can be really helpful if you have a demanding patient um, who uh, just isn't satisfied and wants something, use a, use a placebo. But once again, the placebo probably is not going to be um, used that frequently in acute uh, or probably used very rarely in acute because either the person is going to get better or you're going to change a remedy. It's primarily for uh, constitutional uh, case taking. Uh, acutes in constitutional care. Uh, uh, when you're treating someone constitutionally, um, they will have acute problems. Uh, and there's two ways of um, handling this. If someone is receiving their good constitutional remedy, sometimes the acute problem will just work its way through. It'll just take care of itself. You can also um, use low dosages of the constitutional remedy. So let's say you give a 200C of calcarea carbonica and they're doing well, but they get a, a fever. You don't want to give belladonna. Um, you want to give a low dose of the calcarea carbonica, like a 6C or something like that. Um, you can give herbal medicines, vitamins. Uh, you want to avoid allopathic medicines, but sometimes allopathic medicines are better than um, interfering with the constitutional remedy. Because if you prescribe an acute remedy, it usually interferes with the constitutional remedy in, uh, in general. So you have that, if you have that calcarea carbonica case and they develop a fever, you want to be careful uh, not to give uh, belladonna. You want to give a repeat the uh, a low dose of the calcarea carbonica uh, or use uh, some other method. And the question is, well, why why is that? Well, the homeopathic remedy is is the constitutional remedy is acting, and um, you really don't want to interfere with that action. The body is becoming stabilized. So maybe that acute situation that has developed is a return of old symptoms or it's the body uh, healing, hearing's laws in place, the body's healing from inside outward, etc. So sometimes this can be a dilemma, can be very difficult, but when you're studying constitutional prescribing, uh, this will become clearer. But once again, Typically, in acute situations, um, it's not a problem. But be aware, if you do see somebody who's taking a constitutional remedy and they want you to treat them for an acute problem, you know, be careful. You want to maybe talk to their homeopathic doctor to make sure that, um, you know, what's, what's going on.
So limits of prescribing. The myth of the perfect the myth of perfect safety. Giving the wrong remedy, giving the wrong potency, repeating the remedy too frequently, prescribing beyond your skill level. The physician who has himself for a patient has a full for a doctor. I like that. So let's talk about each one of these uh, that have to deal with the limits of prescribing. Oh, I'm going to have to go back. Um, homeopathic remedies are not perfectly safe. I already mentioned that some low potency remedies of uh, toxic substance like lachesis or heavy metal, if they are repeated too frequently, you can induce uh, poisoning, especially if somebody takes a whole bottle of the homeopathic remedy. You know, generally speaking, giving the wrong remedy uh, may not cause a problem. Uh, or the wrong potency, uh, but sometimes it can. Usually, this is not a problem, as I mentioned, in acute prescribing. It's more of an issue for constitutional case taking. That's why this course mainly dealt with acute prescribing. I hope many of you will be interested in learning more about constitutional prescribing uh, because this is where you really see the beauty and power of homeopathy. Uh, repeating the remedy too frequently, remember when in dot wait, or give SACLAC, um, prescribing beyond your skill level. Um, you know, at this stage, if you have not had, uh, if this is your only course, I would, I would say be very careful in treating some deep disease. I mean, certainly you wouldn't want to treat a neurological problem. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, cancer, um, you know, uh, long-standing arthritis, long-standing digestive problems. Uh, you know, you really don't want to get involved with that at this point. And certainly be careful treating yourself. So why don't remedies or why remedies don't always work? Well, you give the wrong remedy. And this has happened many times to me. I give a remedy and nothing happened. Maybe the remedy has not been discovered yet. We're constantly doing more provings. We're studying more remedies. Um, and we're trying to fine tune. But I really believe that, you know, there are many remedies out there. And a well-chosen remedy will, will have some positive effect. Certain conditions are beyond the capacity of homeopathy to cure. And of course, my opinion in that has is, is changed. Um, when I first went into homeopathy, I thought homeopathy could cure everything. And now I'm feeling, uh, and then for a while I felt that there was only certain diseases that responded well, but now I'm feeling the other way. Um, I just returned from the American Institute of Homeopathic Meeting where they discussed the work of uh, Vijayakar, a brilliant Indian homeopath is doing phenomenal work in terms of treating uh, uh, congenital problems like Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, with amazing results and uh, using, you know, basic uh, homeopathy, nothing, nothing fancy, just, you know, perceiving the case and uh, using the remedies and waiting. Um, so it really illustrated to me, you know, the power of, uh, of, uh, of homeopathy. Um, oh, Debbie wants to know the spelling, V-J-A-K-A-R, V-I-J-A-K-A-R, V-J-A-K-A-R. There's also this idea of the case is incurable. Um, you know, end-stage cancer, um, you know, a person with a weak vital force or inability to, you know, fight off the disease. That's always a possibility. Um, I already talked about the wrong potency. Sometimes if the potency is too high or too low, you're not going to get a good effect. A big concern is the medicine is inactive. Maybe the homeopathic remedy that you're using, and if you haven't purchased it from a reputable pharmacy, it's inactive. 
or somehow it's been uh, antidoted. So a lot of homeopaths, what they do, if they pick a remedy and it has no action and they're pretty sure it's the right remedy, they get it from another pharmacy and try it again. And there have been some reported cases where you get a much better action. Obstacles to cure. Um, you know, if someone is living in a cold, damp environment and it's an aggravating factor for their homeopathic cure, they have to get rid of that obstacle to cure. If uh, they're a heavy coffee drinker and Nux Vomica is their remedy, obviously they have to make some changes and, and eliminate the coffee if they want to cure. And also this whole idea that, you know, our body has a wisdom and mentally and emotionally, uh, karmically, uh, whatever you want to call it, we have to learn from our illness. And sometimes we're not ready to be healed. Okay, let's um, do a couple of cases. And, um, of course, everybody, you got these slides, so it's not like we're going to be working on it. Uh, so maybe let's um, look at some of these symptoms. I don't know if you, if you folks actually went through these cases. Let me... Go back here. So let me just read through this. A 38-year-old female, rectal fissures, um, bad spasms. So these are all threes, aggravated after stool. But typically, that is uh, not an unusual symptom. You know, if you have rectal fissures, normally it's aggravated after stool. Pain is ameliorated, hot bathing. Uh, that may be something that is unique uh, because uh, typically you would think that maybe ice would help reduce the inflammation or coldness, but the pain is eliminated, hot bathing. Spasm is aggravated by anxiety or thinking something stressful. Um, we like that because anytime there's an emotional component, um, that has like a, a stronger weight. Remember, when we're taking a case, we're always looking at uh, the specific unique symptom, um, but we're also holding greater weight when it comes to generalities and mental and emotional symptoms. Um, by generalities, um, it's something that occurs in the whole body. For example, if they're, if this female is describing spasms, the spasms are in the rectal area. But if the whole body was going into spasms, that would be a general. So if she states that the pain is ameliorated by hot bathing, and she's talking about just the rectal fissures, that's a local. A general would be her whole body feels better with hot bathing or she is more relaxed with hot bathing. So I hope that differential or that subtle difference, you understand that subtle, subtle difference. So the general has more weight than the local. Of course, when we're doing a case taking, we want to find out the local peculiar features of each symptom. And these are called modalities. So the key modality is here is the, the spasms are in pain or worse from hot bathing and the spasm is, um, or the, the pain is ameliorated, I'm sorry, from hot bathing. It's aggravated by anxieties. The other modality is it radiate down the back to the leg. Uh, the person is constipated. Okay. And the symptoms began approximately the same time that she separated from their husband. So we need to look into that. Let's see. 
So let's look here. Uh, spasms, sympathetic grief. Let, let me just check here. I'm, oh, here. I thought this was a different case, but it's the same case. Chili, low energy, desires cheese, fruit, much anxiety, uh, crying spells. We have a lot of emotional things trapped in life and do not know what to do. Um, so there's a lot. Sometimes when you have all this emotional stuff, it's tough to differentiate, you know, what is uh, important. Um, the anxiety, guilt about her husband leaving, crying spells, grief, sensitive and sympathetic. So uh, we always like to see some mental and emotional component to the disease, but sometimes there's just it's just overwhelming and you have to start, kind of sort through it. So these are some of the uh, uh, materia medica, uh, fissures, rectum fissures, rectum spasm. Let's look up in your Kent's repertory, mind, anxiety of conscience. So let's go into the mind section, anxiety. of conscience, and that's on page six, as if guilty of a crime. That seemed to be kind of strong with her. We can look at some of the remedies, aluminum, arsenicum, arum, chalidonium, digitalis, they're in bold, but there's a lot of remedies there. Uh, stomach desire cheese, stomach desire fruit, um, grief, sympathy. So, the remedy that was prescribed was Ignatia 1M. Now, um, she responded well. The anxiety and grief lifted. No longer felt trapped in her life. No longer had cravings for fruit or cheese. Uh, became less chilly. Her energy substantially improved. She had a good response to the Ignatia. Um, so let's look at uh, Ignatia. I mentioned earlier, let's go into uh, Borakis Materia Medica under Ignatia. And I mentioned that uh, Ignatia earlier in the lecture today that Ignatia is a um, acute of natrum muriaticum. Uh, what do I mean? It's a, an acute. Well, um, there are certain uh, remedies, constitutional remedies, that display certain characteristics in an acute state. So in this situation, um, it is, uh, you could probably conclude that her remedy picture, the fissures and all this were related to the grief, uh, the trauma uh, from the separation of her husband and the way her body reacts. So there's a good chance that she uh, may have been a nature muriatic and constitution, but the Ignatia is the acute. So, um, in, in Boraki, if you look on page 342, um, Ignatia, second sentence, mentally the emotional element is uppermost and coordination of function is interfered with. It's one of the chief remedies for hysteria. Um, effects of grief and worry. Changeable mood, sighing, sobbing. Um, let's see, rectum, um, itching and stitching in the rectum, prolapse, stools pass easily with difficulty, hemorrhage and pain, worse when a stool is loose, there's nothing there about heat, urine, 
sleep very light fever. And if you look at the bottom, complimentary nap muir. Worse in the morning, uh, uh, open air, smoking. So let's go and just look. Rectum fissures. Okay, so the, rec the rectum section, if you're there at the rectum section. Okay. Here we go, rectum, abdominum, hem hemorrhoids, uh, fissures. Okay, I'm looking page 617, rectum fissures. And Ignatia is there in italics. So we have that. And uh, let's see other characteristics. So Ignatia is a remedy, um, uh, ailments from grief. Um, let's look mind. Mind ailments grief. And it may be under grief ailments. Yeah, let's look mind grief. Okay, here we are. Mine, grief. And you can see Ignatia is a, a bold there. So the characteristics of Ignatia are um, ailments from grief. It's a remedy, uh, a lot of spasm. It's an emotional remedy. And um, uh, rectal fissures, the anxiety. And so... The one M uh, had a remarkable, remarkable effect on this patient. Now let's go to another case. Any questions on that case, Ignatia? Twenty-three-year-old with acute pharyngitis has been going on for ten days began after her boyfriend cheated on her with another woman. All right, so we have an event here that developed a sore throat. And um, we just need to know, there was an event that occurred cheating, but we need to know what the reaction was. Pain is severe, left-sided, aggravated swallowing liquids, especially hot drinks. Cannot stand anything touching her neck. There is hawking of mucus. On exam, the tonsils are purple in color. Pain extends to the ear. So these are the materia medica, throat pain left. Pain swallowing liquids, throat pain warm drink aggravates. External throat clothing aggravates. Let's look at that rubric. Let's... Um, Go to uh, Kent, and we're going to look at external throat. Okay, maybe uh, okay. Uh, oh, there. I'm sorry. There was a question. Uh, how did they know to start the 1M potency? Um, that's a good question because typically if the pathology is really deep and the manifestations of the remedy are really clear, then you would go with a higher potency. Um, so this case had a lot of really clear things with Ignatia. Everything covered Ignatia, very strong and also the nature of the vital force was strong, you'd go with the 1M.
And you can use this analogy when you're doing an acute prescribing. If symptoms for a remedy are very clear, let's say you have the belladonna case, and it's classic um, 3 p.m. aggravation, high fever, redness, uh, heat, uh, etc., uh, craving for lemonade, everything is really there and it's intense, you can go with a 1M. I'm not saying that a 30C wouldn't help, but usually in a very uh, intense acute situation like this, you're probably going to have to repeat the remedy more frequently because it's so strong. So if you study constitutional homeopathy, you'll learn the importance of potency. And generally speaking, if the symptoms match the remedy very clearly and very strongly, then you want to go to a higher uh, potency like a 1M. Okay, so I'm looking at external throat clothing aggravates. External throat begins um, on page 471. Clothing aggravates. And this is an interesting and important symptom that these people don't like, like a turtleneck or cloth on their neck. Typically, all of the uh, snake remedies have this. Scent gris is a snake, snake remedy, crotalus horridus, and lachesis, throat scraping. So, um, Let's go. So Lachesis 30C, four doses. Now, you may want to ask, you know, why wasn't a 1M given or a 200C? Um, probably a 200C or a 1M would have worked. Because look, Lachesis 30C, four doses uh, were given. That means that probably you needed a higher uh, potency. Um, so lachesis is a uh, remedy, a very jealous remedy. It's a snake remedy. We studied it in our um, um, uh, Materia Medica uh, for um, uh, sore throats earlier. So this is a good example. So in addition, uh, the throat problem is completely recovered in 32 hours and the ang anger and jealousy uh, resolved uh, towards the boyfriend. So another good example. Questions on this case? Questions? Okay, this is an animal case, a seven-year-old parrot. Partial paralysis of the left wing Convulsions with throwing his head backwards. Chilly. Stand at the far end of the cage next to the heating duct. So that's a confirmation that the bird was chilly, noisy, and irritable. Was fuss and visitors come and be occupied by the owner's attention. He felt the bird was jealous. This behavior ended with paralysis when the burger became listless. His vet was unable to make a definitive diagnosis and said nothing can be done. So generalities, apoplexy, convulsions, opus which is an extension of the back, heat, lack of heat, jealousy. So nux vomica. I'm beginning the whole idea of using homeopathic remedies for animals because I have uh, 50 goats, donkeys, cows, chickens, etc. And homeopathy just works extremely well in animals. And um, I, I think it's not because I'm a brilliant homeopath, it's just because animals have a healthy vital force, they don't have a lot of suppression, they haven't taken antibiotics, and all the other things that have you know messed up our uh, vital force, they respond very well. And I think I shared with you a case of uh, uh, a goat that was attacked uh, and um, was on, on the deathbed, uh, barely breathing, and I gave carbo vegetabilis, and, and the goat responded, which was kind of a miracle to me. Uh, there's a question out there, okay to give four doses? Um, 
Well, the reason why, um, and I think you're referring, let me go back, four doses uh, on the previous case. Let's see. Let me unmute you, Debbie. Debbie? Yes, that's correct, because I, I, you made me aware that we have to be careful with those ones that are like the snake poison. Right. Uh, the reason why four doses was given, that case was so strong, there was such a, a strong emotional component, probably the wrong potency was given to begin with. A 200C or a 1M should have been given. You know, the problems with the boyfriend, the boyfriend was cheating, the sore throat. Yeah. So probably a 200C was given. That's why the 30C was repeated. Now, the 30C just wasn't repeated, like take it every hour. The 30C was probably given, and the throat uh, pain maybe improved a little bit, then it came back. So the prescriber gave it again. Then it improved again, maybe a little longer, but it came back. So in other words, you just don't give the four dosages. You give the remedy, and then you wait. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, I would just be a little nervous about giving four doses of the snake poison. Well, no, you can give it a long time. First of all, 30C, there's no physical substance in, in the 30C, number one. Once you go um, uh, beyond a 12C, there's no physical substance. So there's no snake venom in a, in a 12C or greater. Uh, the danger in repeating a homeopathic remedy is you'll get approving. But in this case... And in any case, if the person responds um, and you know it's the correct remedy, it's just you haven't matched the vital force, then repeat it again. Now, it's much different if you have a case and you give a remedy and there's no response, nothing. Then you repeat it again and again and again. Then you can get a remedy proving that's where there's a problem. But it's important to understand is if you give a remedy and there is a positive response, that means it's a good remedy. If it stops working, either it's the wrong remedy or uh, it's not the right potency. So you give the remedy again. Anytime you have a positive action and it stops working, you give the remedy again. So it happened again and maybe you like to see it acting a little bit longer, you repeat it again. So in this situation, I don't think there was any danger in, you know, giving four doses. There would be a danger if you repeated it four or five times and there was no action. Then okay. you could get a homeopathic proving. Um, so you want to look for that initial action. Yeah, I just worry about it a little bit when it comes to deal with the poisons mm -hmm. rather than like a belladonna or something simple like that. Well, no, belladonna is a poison. In fact, belladonna is a, a severe poison. It can kill you just like the lachesis. But remember, a 30C has no physical substance. There's okay. nothing in there. All right, okay. thank you. Good. Okay, another case, a 32-year-old male with uh, GI influenza started after constant worrying about his mother's health. Um, so we always like a little mental uh, GI influenza, worrying, constant vomiting, great desire for ice-cold drinks. When the water warms in his stomach, it is immediately vomited. That's a keynote right there. That should have pointed, at least when I hear that, I'm thinking of, of, of the remedy. Perfuse diarrhea, intense burning. The symptoms are much worse in twilight. So let's look. Um, this is the stomach desires cold drinks. Let's look at that. Stomach and see if somebody can find that in the repertory. And shoot out the page number. Okay, desires, there's a big section here, desires, cold drinks. I have it on 484. Good, Debbie got it, 484 cold drinks. You can just look over some of those remedies. 
desires. You know, uh, we talked about the hierarchy with symptoms, you know, the mental and the generals. Your body temperature has a lot of value, whether you're warm and chilly, because certain remedies are warm, certain remedies are chilly. Also, your thirst. Uh, if you're thirsty, thirstless, and if uh, you have a thirst for warm or cold, these things tend to have uh, greater value. Now, phosphorus, 200C single dose was given, and that is the characteristic um, symptom of phosphorus. Let me go back is when water warms in the stomach, it is immediately vomited. And if you go to the uh, Materia Medica, uh, Borakis Materia Medica, and let's look up phosphorus, okay? Phosphorus, all right, and look up uh, stomach. Let's see. Here, stomach. Water is thrown up, and I'm at the bottom of page 508. Um, vomiting. Water is thrown up as soon as it gets warm in the stomach. Very peculiar symptoms. They like cold water, but as soon as it gets warm, it's thrown up. And I'm not sure if there is a um, um, rubric for that. Let's see. 507? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, Debbie, you, you, you gave, uh, 507. Hello, Debbie. Page 507. It was my mistake. No, it's 508. It was my mistake. Sorry. Okay. Where, where are we? 508. Okay. Uh, liquids. I'm looking at the warming of liquids in the stomach. If you. If you find out, if anybody find out, I'm not sure. It's on sure. page 508. Okay, we're on 508. Um, at the very bottom where it says stomach. I, I see liquids. On 508 it says stomach. Water is thrown up as soon as it gets warm in the stomach. Okay, that's a good one. I can't, I can't find it. 508? At I the bottom of 508, it says stomach. I think I have a different Kent's repertory than you. It's right underneath mouth. It shows mouth first. First it okay, says stomach, and then okay, stomach. Mouth in, then mucus, music, operations on abdomen. Yeah, your, your book... By Boricky, um, oh. it's always been off a little bit. Oh, no, bit. wait. You're reading it from Boricky. No, I'm looking at... Um, the Repertory. I'm reading it from the Repertory by Boricky, page okay, 508. No, no, I'm, I'm trying to find the rubric. Oh, See, I see the bottom in 508 in Boricky. Yeah, throws up as soon as the water gets warm in the stomach. Yeah, I see that there, but I'm looking in Kent, the actual rubric. Oh, I see. Okay. See, Boricky is the materia medica. Yes. I'm looking for a the actual uh, rubric in Kent. So there's warm drinks, stomia, stomach. The only thing that I can find is on page 510. Okay, if you look at 510, nausea, warm drinks. There's phosphorus. 
So, you know, nausea from warm drinks. So warming up in the stomach. I haven't been able to find that. Um, maybe um, when we take a little break, I'll see if I can find it, okay? Because I do want to take about a 10 or 15 minute break. And I'll look for that rubric, warming in the stomach. That's a deficiency, and I think this illustrates that, that some things that are written in Boraki in the Materia Medica just are not in Kent's repertory. So there's a wealth of knowledge in both books. So that's why, um, you know, when you do your remedy differential, you need to go to Boraki and read about the remedy to see those features. So phosphorus, single dose symptoms were gone. Okay, let's do another one. Uh, Two-year-old uh, with an ear infection for 10 days. No response to antibiotic. Ear infection started after her father left to go overseas. So once again, ear infection is kind of related to um, some emotional distress. I always like to ask, you know, uh, what was going on in your life when your symptoms developed? Um, there's something in homeopathy. I've never been well since. And that should be music to a homeopath's ears. Never been well since. Because that is tying it in to some type of an emotional event or trauma, etc. Uh, she got sick with cold and immediately went to her right ear. Temperature of 101. And is pulling on the ear. Yellow green discharge from the nose and right eye. She loves constellation and is ameliorated constellation. Our mother says she is more clinging than usual, craving cold foods. And air inflammation media, mind forsaken feeling, constellation ameliorates. Let's look up that in Kent. Um, because that's an important rubric that will help you uh, differentiate homeopathic remedies. Because some remedies like consolation, others hate it. All right, so consolation aggravates. I see that uh, on page 16. Mind, consolation, aggravate. And there's only one remedy. Consolation ameliorates pulsatilla at the bottom. See, consolation aggravate on 16, and at the, right at the bottom of that, pulsatilla ameliorates. Uh, wait, am I losing this here? Wait, what, what happened here? So the remedy, I don't have the remedy here, but it was uh, um, wait. Okay, ear inflammation, media, mind forsaken. And the remedy is what? It's not on your slides. I guess it was missing. Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, Todd, did you, did you want to say something, Todd? Um, I mean, just the one we looked at, but isn't the pulsatilla, isn't the pulsatilla consistent with the consolation and weepy and... Yeah, and it's, clinging? it's one of the number one remedies for ear inflammation. For ear, so, right. So it fits, it fits beautifully. Two-year-old... Uh, ear infection when her father went out of her seat, so it's kind of like an abandonment issue. Uh, Yellow-green discharge, which is characteristic of pulsatilla. Uh, clingy, loves consolation. So, okay. Um, I'm going to take about a 15-minute break, okay?
I need a bathroom break. And let's let's come back in uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Let me just see here. I'm going to pause the recording and I'll be right back. Okay. All right. Uh, back. And uh, let's go on. Okay, the next case is um, a 30 year old female, uh, nausea, vomiting, pregnancy, uh, first pregnancy, and she just started her second trimester, overwhelmed trying to work and care for her sick mother in law at home. So there's an emotional tie in being overwhelmed, caring for a sick mother-in-law, which would cause a lot of demands. Um, but once again, if this person was with you, you'd be inquiring as to how she reacts with this. Is this just causing her anger? Is it causing her grief? Um, symptoms started about three weeks ago, unable to keep much food on sensitive to odors or the sight of any food feels much worse at 3 to 5 p.m burning pain in your stomach uh, sour erectations the only thing she really craves are pickles which are very sour and a concomitant sensation of bearing down in the abdomen So stomach, uh, vomiting a pregnancy, generalities, afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. So let's look at that generalities, afternoon, 3 to 5. Those time modalities I like. Generalities, and it's in the beginning of the generalities chapter, which makes it easy for you to look up time. Generalities afternoon, uh, 3 to 5 p.m. So there really isn't anything uh, 3 to 5. There's 4 to 6, which is pretty close. That's sepia. There's 4 p.m. Lycopodium is strong. 4 to 8, lycopodium. So the closest 4 to 6 p.m. would be sepia. Stomach desires food pickles. So let's look up that. Stomach. And I think you could probably see um, stomach desires, desires sour things too. That's also there. But there's a version desire, desire. Okay, desires. Cucumbers, uh, oh, pickles, there we are, uh, pickles, chamomilla, separ, hyperlexis, uh, sulfur, veratrum. All right, let's look up desires, maybe sour things, salty things, sour acids. There's sour acids. Okay. Then there's also vinegar. All right. Okay, so sepia. Uh, 200 C single dose symptoms resolved in 48 hours and did not recur much. Better and relaxed with her mother in law, was able to continue working at the time of her delivery. Um, so desires pickles, uh, sepia wasn't there for pickles, um, but it was there for sour acids. So let's look in the, um, boric under sepia.
Okay, sepia, and that starts on page 586. And uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, indifference to those love best, averse to occupation of family, dreads to be alone. It's a big um, female remedy. Um, CPI has a tendency to like sour things. And it can also be um, antidoted by sour things. Um, and it's it's tied into um, um, ailments uh, uh, from pregnancy. And uh, let's see. And... Uh, Pain bearing down is strong for that. Evictations in the generalities, uh, three to five. So, sepia, a single dose. Uh, symptoms resolve within 48 hours. Okay. So, questions on the cases that we finished. Any questions? Okay. All right. Okay. The next steps. Um, uh, where are you right now and where do you want to be? Now, the um, American Medical College of Homeopathy, which this is her, their course, and I'm proud to be on the faculty at the American Medical College of Homeopathy. They have a, a three-year class. Um and they also have a doctorate program of classical homeopathy, which hasn't started yet. The three-year class, I believe, has a lot of online um, webinars, and you are required to go to Phoenix, Arizona, I believe, twice a year. That's a three-year class. Um, <clears throat> the American Medical College of Homeopathy has active provings that are always taking place. And one of the best ways to learn about homeopathy is to get involved with approving. And approving is a, a group of people get together. They take a uh, homeopathic remedy, which you are not aware of. And um, then um, you come back in a couple of weeks and you discuss it. You make a remedy picture. And then you discover what the remedy is. It can be uh, an amazing way to appreciate the uh, power of, of homeopathy. Also, observing in a clinic. Um, you know, observing an experienced homeopathic doctor. And at the American Medical College of Homeopathy, they do have a clinic where you can take part. So several of you have um, asked me to um, get involved with teaching the next level of homeopathy. So what, I'm, what I came up with is training in constitu constitutional homeopathy, and this is going to be limited to 10 patients. And the goal of the program is to educate students in the understanding of case-taking techniques, also follow-up analysis, and expand your knowledge of Materia Medica and improve your diagnosis of uh, Materia Medica. So this is the logistics. It's going to be limited to 10 participants. We're going to have four meetings of uh, two days each at the Florida Wellness Center here just north of Tampa. And these are the following tentative dates. Of course, these dates may change. I hope they don't change because if I make a commitment with the dates, but if something does come up and it turns out there's a major holiday or something like that that I'm not aware of, will probably change. But the first class is going to be June 22nd and 23rd. We have a welcome dinner Friday evening. And then Saturday, uh, classes will be from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. 
We'll have an evening session at the poolside and at the hot tub discussing homeopathy. And Sunday, it'll be a shorter day, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., so you folks can get back home. So this is the structure, uh, which is based on my experience in teaching homeopathy. <clears throat> Each participant will come uh, with the case they've already taken, and they'll present the case to the group. Um, <clears throat> suggestions will be made, uh, the case taking techniques will be reviewed, and then what we're going to do is we're going to make a Skype phone call to the person to investigate the case in more detail. So if you are participating in this program, you will begin to take some cases on your own, collect the material, do the best you can, and put it in written form. Then you'll present it to the class, and uh, we'll discuss it and make some suggestions and discussion, remedy selections, etc. And then we're going to actually make a phone call, and then we'll be asking questions, reviewing certain aspects to try to come up with the right remedy. Um, also at this time, during the first day, I'll be taking a live case to illustrate case taking techniques. So I'll have a patient come in, I'll sit with the patient and take a live case. Um, and you'll observe and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. So this is um, of the Florida Wellness Center. Um, we have accommodations for 10 people here. This is the swimming pool right here, and the conference room, the main conference room, is right here next to the pool. Uh, it's 50 acres, 45 minutes north of Tampa. You can fly either into Tampa or Orlando. It's a fully functioning organic ranch with a garden, chicken, goats, cows, donkeys, and pigs. We have a basketball court, swimming pool, hot tub, weight room, infrared sauna, many miles of sandy roads for jogging. And if you like bass fishing, the ranch borders on Lake Moody, one of the top bass lakes in Florida. And this is Lake Moody, which is on the uh, northern border of the property. And this is our conference room right here. I was giving a, a conference to a couple of medical doctors. So what we're going to do is we're going to hook up the Skype call. So we'll be able to interview the patient right here and ask questions. This is our dining uh, facility. Now, this is where the fun part gets, the second meeting. And um, although we are requiring um, that you don't have to attend every meeting, but I think that you do have to make a commitment to attend all four so we have continuity. So during the second meeting, well, each student and myself will present a new case, and we're going to do a follow-up on the previous month's case. Well, not the previous month's, previous three months, because we're, we're meeting every three months. So we're going to find out how the homeopathic remedy worked. So we're really going to test homeopathy. And we'll also do a live Skype follow-up for the class to review. So... Um, so the first session, you'll be presenting a live case. We'll do the Skype interview. Uh, we'll recommend a homeopathic remedy. The homeopathic remedy will be prescribed. And then in three months, we're going to do a, a follow-up. You're going to present a follow-up. Each student's going to present a follow-up. And then um, we'll determine whether we want to continue the remedy or change it. In addition, you're going to have one new case to present. So you're going to get a lot of exposure. If we have 10 students, that means um, the first session, because everyone's going to be a greenhorn and just getting started, we're going to have 10 or 11 uh, presentations, 10 students plus myself, 11 case presentations in that time period. Uh, then the following in three months, uh, we're going to do 11 follow-ups and 11 more case presentation. So you can see you're going to get a lot of exposure to homeopathy. If the patient lives in Florida, then they're welcome to come in person to the Wellness Center for the homeopathic interview. So I'm going to try to have 
actual live people come but if those of you that live in Florida or if you want to bring somebody to the Wellness Center uh, you can do that so um, this is uh, Nancy Herrick and Roger Morrison they had some a nice testimony nice testimony to say about me they said I'm a Renaissance man unique inquisitive mind extraordinary doctor healer farmer homeopathic teacher and I've been teaching homeopathy probably for about 10 years, maybe longer. And they strongly encourage you folks to study with me to absorb my knowledge. And also, my goal is to make sure we have a good time. So what is your investment uh, for this course? Each session is $695. And uh, it's a two-day session that includes two nights at our Florida Wellness Center and all of your meals. So uh, we have beautiful rooms um, available and um, food is phenomenal. So that's all your meals. Um, if you decide you don't want to stay at the center, we do have a local hotel. Uh, the, it's the Hampton Inn in Dade City. You could stay there and the tuition is reduced to $495, but you're not going to save any money because the Hampton Inn, I think, charges um, $160 a night. So there's a 10% discount for paying for all four classes in advance. So once again, it's strictly limited to 10 students. We can't handle any more, so we'll have a nice small class. Um, we do require a $300 non-refundable deposit to reserve your space. And then we require payment um, prior to each class uh, session. Um, so we're about 30 minutes north of Tampa. The easiest airport to fly into is Tampa or Orlando. So some of you who have kids, you know, you may want to tie it into a vacation to Orlando. Orlando, you know, has um, all the major Disney World, the Universal theme, uh, Universal Park, etc. cetera. So um, let's see. So that's all I have for the, the next step. Um, so... Um, any any questions? Uh, anybody have any questions? Now, this is the first time I'm teaching this acute class, and I think all of you will be getting a diploma uh, from the American Medical College of Homeopathy. I'm not sure if you have to pass a final exam. Uh, I just contacted the college. Um, so, um, and I'll be sending you, uh, uh, the video of this, this recording and I'll let you know if, um, um, you have to take a final exam. So any any questions? It's kind of sad for me. This is our last class. I really enjoyed uh, teaching all of you, and I hope this has been a positive introduction to homeopathy. And I'd love to see you um, at the constitutional course that I'm going to be teaching. I know some of you live cross country, but I think you'll find Florida to be a very enjoyable place. We have just a wonderful facility here at the Florida Wellness Center. And what makes it beautiful is that you'll be staying uh, right at the center. So not only will we be having classes during the day, we'll be able to hang out in the evening too and relax and you know discuss homeopathy. But I think that this uh, immersion method of doing a lot of cases, uh, discussing the cases, and... Um, actually doing follow-ups because it's one thing to recommend a homeopathic remedy and not know what happened. So you'll be getting a lot of experience in follow-up examination. And at the same time, 
we'll be lecturing and talking about uh, each specific homeopathic remedy that's prescribed in, in more detail. Um, so if there are no questions, um, and if you want to email me uh, with, uh, oh, um, Craig has a question. Are you going to go over home, homeopathic software recommendations? There are two choices, um, radar or McRepertory. Uh, both of them are excellent homeopathic software. And I would probably, if you are interested in getting some software, is to just get the intro package, the basic intro package, because some of these programs are extremely expensive. You can pay four or five thousand dollars for the homeopathic software. Um, I would just get a simple um, and what I'll do is when I send you a copy of um, um, these slides and uh, when I uh, when, when I send you the audio and uh, the webinar, uh, the audio and video of this webinar, I'll send you an attachment of contact people. There's a company called Whole Health Supply that is the vendor for the radar. They have really good tech support, um, but you should probably go to a homeopathic meeting uh, and when you do sign up for a, a homeopathic class like this one, they will give you a discount. If you say that you're a student of Dr. Kondrat and you attended the acute prescribing, they will give students a, a discount. Uh, radar is R-A-D-A-R. And the company is Whole Health Supply. Uh, let me send this. Whole Health Supply. And let me, uh, let me just see if we can do this. Whole Health Supply. There we go. <laughs> oh, that's not it. Let me go to Whole Health Radar. Here we go. It's Whole Health Now, that's the website. Okay, so this is the website, Whole Health Now uh, software. Uh, radar. Let's see, Let's see what, what the price is for this. Radar testimonials. This is the program I use. I love it. Let's see. Software prices, radar modules. Sankaran module. Dynamic case. Now, these are just modules. So, um, Let's see. Uh, radar packages, that's what you want, because the modules are kind of add-on. Okay. So they don't give you the price. Oh, uh, here we are. All right. So this is probably the price right here. You're looking at $840. That's like just for the essentials, the intro uh, module. And you can see the complete is uh, $6,320. So these programs are not cheap. So I would um, 
call up and, you know, tell them that you are a student of Dr. Kondrat. And I'm actually one of the contributing authors for Radar. If you go into the I section, much of the work in the I and Vision section has been updated uh, by me. And uh, I think they'll give you an additional discount after this $840. The one thing I want you to be certain is you're going to be losing a lot if you jump right into um, uh, using the radar program, the software program, without reading. Even if you do get the, the radar program or homeopathic software, make sure that you read the Materia Medica. Um, you, you read Kent's repertory because that's where you can really gain uh, knowledge and help. Uh, the second is Mick Repertory. Mick Repertory. That's the second one. And let me go to Mick Repertory. I, at one time, I owned both uh, softwares. I had McRepertory and uh, here and Radar. Let's see if I can find it here. Here we are, Kent. Homeopathic associations. This is this is where you want to go. And this is the McRepertory Pro. Let's see. Order page. Okay, McRepertory with core library, uh, we're looking at $1,040. That seems to be the cheapest. Uh, this is not, this is reference works. This is an add-on. Uh, so these are some of the packages. So McRepertory is probably a little bit pricier. A little bit pricier. Okay, those are the two software, and I'll send you links on both of these both of these programs. Okay. Okay. Other other questions. Okay, if there's no other questions, I want to appreciate all of you. It's kind of sad for me. The course is over. If you do have to take a final exam, I believe everybody will get a diploma. You'll get credit towards your homeopathic certification. If you do need to take an, an examination, I'll send you the link for that. But right now, I haven't heard from the college whether or not um, uh, you need that. Okay, everybody, thanks so much and good luck with all your future uh, homeopathic education. Take care.